Hi, and welcome to this podcast. My name is Carrie Hyde, and I am your host and your pet's life coach. I have been doing podcasting now. This is our going, we're in our seventh season. If you're listening to this, this is our seventh season. Some people know me, some people don't. I own a wellness center in Tustin, California, Orange County, California. I've had it for 21 years, and about two, three years ago, I decided that I needed backup. I needed people who were in the industry for a long time who could help me help people and not like people were thinking I was crazy. Like I'm a nutcase when I said, don't use flea and tick medication or don't do this or don't do that. So I had to seek out people that I thought understood who were deep in it and understood. And of course that made me reach out to some unbelievably fabulous veterinarians that we've had on the show. And, and it's, interesting to me because every once in a while, I just, I get so nervous and I I don't know that anybody realizes this, but when I talk to veterinarians, like the veterinarian I'm going to introduce you to in a few minutes, it's like a movie star to me. Like, I don't want to embarrass her, but I get, my hands are sweating and I get super nervous and excited because I, it's, it's a group that I felt like I was the only member in for many, 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 many years. And then when I started to get more vocal and come out and talk, I learned that I wasn't the only one and it was a very large group and it's growing. So I'm super excited to introduce you to today, Dr. Judy Morgan. Dr. Morgan, how are you? I'm doing very well today. Thank you. You're such a ray of sunshine. You really are. Like, I I know, like, I'm not trying to be cheesy or embarrass you, but I just... It really is such an eye opener and to meet people. I stalk the veterinarians before I bring them (laughs) on this show. So most of you know, I don't do a show all like I don't have thousands of them. I have to stalk people for a really long time. So I stalked you for it's probably been two years that I've been stalking you. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm not crazy. I swear. I just want to make sure because I think most what I call really, truly understanding the depth of holistic medication, medicine and uh, herbalism, the veterinarians that are really understand it, understand also that there are veterinarians that call themselves holistic and they are not, which is why I have to stalk you guys because I don't, (laughs) so I apologize in stalking you. Um, But tell us a little bit, I know a lot of people know you, you're so world renowned and people know you from everywhere, but just tell me real quick, what veterinary school did you go to? University of Illinois. So Midwest traditional, uh, graduated in 1984. So, you know, early eighties, very traditional. Yeah. Yeah. Did you always want to be a vet? Uh, since I was about 13. Yeah. And so what was your first animal? Uh, first animal growing, well, we always had the obligatory goldfish from the <laughs> five and dime store and they would, you know, of course they were in the, the absolute wrong environment and they would die and have to be replaced probably monthly, if not weekly. We had small turtles, which now have been outlawed because of salmonella. Uh-huh. Um, and we had a dog that was a Cocker Spaniel Irish setter mix. Um, he was not the friendliest of dogs. He was great with family, but not with other people. Um, but he, he was great for us. Uh, but what really changed my life and made me want to be a veterinarian was my sister always wanted to have a horse. I really had no interest in having a horse, but when she got one in junior high, of course I got one too, because if I was going to be at the barn all the time, I might as well have something to do. Um, and our, first set of horses actually ended up dying from something called equine infectious anemia, which is a disease, a viral disease spread by biting flies and mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And our entire farm, all of the horses had to be put to sleep. And I was probably 12 at the time. And it was devastating to your first, your first horse, your first pony. This has been, you know, your best friend. So they were put down and, um, Then that Christmas, my parents surprised us and got us new ponies. Mm -hmm. And they bought me, I will never forget, he was $250. So this was going back to like 1973. So $250 at the time seemed like a lot of money. Now I'm like, wow, I wish I could find a $250 pony. (laughs) Right? Right. He was a show pony. (laughs) Yeah. He was... He was a very high level show pony and, um, but he was old, he was 18 and he was pretty crippled. 
And people thought my parents were nuts for buying me this ancient semi-crippled pony to, to use in the show ring. But I was a fairly beginner rider, and uh, they knew that having a very experienced mount underneath of me would make all the difference in the world. And that pony taught me so much, and we went to mm. so many shows. And what we had to do was we had to give him butazolidin, which is basically horsey aspirin, in order for me to be able to ride him. So four days a week, he got his uh, medication so that I could ride and show. And then the other three days, he had off to rest and recuperate. We did that for um, probably at least two, two and a half years. And then he got to the point where he really was not rideable. And uh, my trainer's daughter was an equine veterinarian from Canada, and she was home for the summer. And she said, there is a surgery I could perform on your pony to make it so that we could at least turn him out in the field, let him be retired with his pony friends, and you can go out and pet him, and you know we don't have to put him down. And I, I said, well, totally that's worth it for that. And my parents spent, I think, $600 on the surgery, so more than double than what the pony cost. Uh, but I got to help. We did the surgery right there on the farm, and they took the nerves out of his front legs, so they were basically numb. And you were how old? And he was probably 20. No, you. Oh, I was 13. 13, and you get to do surgery on her. Oh, my God. So maybe I was 14. But anyway, I was – so I just – I was so enamored by this equine veterinarian, and uh, I just vowed I, I was going to be like her. And um, so it was, it was really just eye-opening, and I never looked back from that day forward. It was, this is what I'm going to do. So here I am. That's so amazing. <laughs> you know, it's funny because when I, when I talk to veterinarians, which I do a lot, sometimes they're, they're not holistic. And I always kind of say, I just want to talk to the veterinarian, that 13-year-old, that 13-year-old that set out to just heal animals because somewhere along the line, vet school or whatever it is, you know, biz, owning a business and clients. And I know it can be really hard when people are yelling at you all the time and you're worried about getting <laughs> sued and you're worried about, and we lose track. But if we could just get our veterinarians to think back to that 13 year old girl or that 13 year old boy and that pony or that dog or that cat that they said, wow, like, this is what I want to do. We could get all of our vets back on track. And I love that you shared that story with us because I, it really is. It's what I always ask that question is like, how did you, when did you know? Because if we could tap into that, it, because it's still there, right? It's still there. Oh, absolutely. But what's really interesting in my first book, uh, the From Needles to Natural, I talk about becoming a veterinarian and, and that story is in there. But the first few stories about my involvement with veterinarians as a young child all involved euthanasia or bad experiences oh, with the veterinarian. Yeah. And it's amazing that I ended up becoming a veterinarian because up until that point, because even my first experience with veterinarians with my first horses, uh -huh. they came and they killed my horse. Yeah. So like, who wants to do that job? <laughs> <laughs> None of my experiences were good. Yeah. And for me to have a total 180 shift because one veterinarian came in to do something mm. that was so life-changing for my pony, yeah. it kept him alive rather than being another euthanasia story. One more reason why I would not like a veterinarian. Instead, here was someone who had that kindness that wanted to do something uh, really nice for a young girl who would get young girls with their horses. Oh. Let me tell you, that's their first love. <laughs> <laughs> boys take a back seat. My dad says it's the best thing he ever did was buy us horses. Cause what boys? <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh no. I wish I would have had a, I wanted a horse when I was a little girl, but it just, I, I grew up in orange County. It wasn't like something that was kind of done. No. Um, I was the <clears> one that just brought home all of the I found him on the side of the road, bomb person, which really was a guy at the grocery store with a box of kittens or a box of puppies. And then I would <laughs> tell my mom, I would lie to my mom and say, it just was laying in the gutter. It was almost dead, <laughs> whatever I had to do. So, but I guess for her sake, it's a good thing. There wasn't horses running around. <laughs> I found him in the well, gutter. 
<laughs> I just adopted five, adopted five donkeys from the kill pen. So yeah. oh, you did. Oh, God bless you. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's amazing. Were you yeah. when you were growing up? Um, were you? Did you grow up in a holistic home? Were you taught any of that kind of stuff? No, no, I know me either. <laughs> we we ate Burger King every day for lunch, dinner, breakfast. Not every day, but we we ate fast food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah, not at all. So no one. What about your parents? Any of them um, doctors or? My mother was a school teacher, and my uh, father was a national sales manager, and then started his own company. Yeah, sales. <laughs> I know. I ask weird questions, but I find that you're like the the life of what gets you to that is so interesting to me. And it's, well, you know, what's really interesting is I commonly say I'm a combination of my parents. Yeah. I am a salesman because I am selling and all veterinarians are salesmen, sure. whether they believe it or not, they are selling good health. They are selling what they believe is the right medicine for that particular pet and that particular problem right. that is going on, but they're also teachers. And now my entire job is teaching people how to take better care of their pets. That's why I write books. That's why I do my, uh, my Facebook lives. That's right. why I write blogs. Um, so I really am a combination of my parents' careers. You really are. And you're absolutely right. Veterinarians are salesmen and teachers. It, the, the best veterinarian is one that wants to teach. If you get, yep. if you take one of those away, right, I want to teach you, but I don't know where to get you the pro the stuff that will help you. You need both of those because otherwise you're yes. just a salesperson and you don't even really know why you're selling it. You're just selling it to sell it. So the combination is amazing to have um, somebody who really, really wants to not just teach you why good food is great, but can also provide you the what you, what you need to make those food, which is why you have all these fabulous books on recipes. And, um, so it's just, it's amazing. Cause you could just be like, Oh yeah, you should just eat raw diet. I don't know. You get it at the store, <laughs> right? <laughs> but Dr. Morgan, uh, for our listeners has some fabulous books that have uh, recipes for your pets. If you want to make the food at home and they're just, they're great. I have some of your books and I just recently bought your one of your books because my 20 year old kitty um, was diagnosed with kidney failure, which which is, you know, I know Rodney Habibi, for those of you who don't know, he's fabulous and had fed his dogs amazing diets forever and ever and ever. And one of his dogs got cancer and he came out and said, wow, how could this happen to me? I did everything right. And it it throws you for a loop. And I, I you know, I understood it when I found out about the situation with him. But I really understood it when my cat, who has been mm -hmm. eating, no, she hasn't been over vaccinated, nothing. And wh why does my cat have kidney failure? <laughs> I just don't understand it. So I got your book and I just, I, this is my little plug for Dr. Morgan's books. They are so, um, they're easy to read, right? So if you have no idea what you're doing or why you're doing it, these books are just fabulous and help you um, read them. Unfortunately, my kitty I think she might've had something more than kidney failure because we caught it soon. And yet in five days we could, but anyway, that's my kidney. Mm. So, but she was 20 years old, which is amazing. And it was you that yeah, makes you wonder if there was an underlying yeah. lymphoma in the kidneys or, you know, something else yeah. going on in there. That's what we thought. Cause it just happened very quickly. And yeah. the, the kidney levels weren't as bad as we anticipated. And we just kind of thought it, but it was you that said to me when I spoke with you on the phone, earlier in the week that sometimes they just outlive their kidneys. Like sometimes it's just, they, it was you that said that to me. And I said, wow, it's such a profound thing to say to someone that is feeling guilty. Like, what did I do wrong? You know, maybe I didn't give her enough exercise. The only thing I kept getting my, did I give her enough exercise? <laughs> like I started doing that, you know, because everything else was right. So it was just a, a really, I want to just thank you publicly for saying yeah. that to me because it mm -hmm. sat with me and I was like, yeah, I mean, if I live to be, 105 some it can't keep going <laughs> so anyway that's true and, and from from a, and this is probably what i said to you but from a traditional chinese medicine standpoint humans are born if everything is right genetically you're born with a hundred years of kidney life Wow. So if you get more than that, you treated your body really well and did everything right. If you get less than that, yeah, you probably should have tweaked a few things. <laughs> but the same for our animals. Yeah. And no one knows what that 
finite number is. And maybe cats are given 20 years of kidney life, but your kidney is your life essence. That's your, it's called Jing, J-I-N-G. Your kidney Jing is your life essence and it it wears out. Yes, we can use food to replenish it. We can use supplements to replenish it, but it has a finite life. We don't know what that life is for animals. And it probably varies by the breed as well as the species. So, so we don't know because we do see a lot of the oriental breeds have kidney problems earlier in life. Uh, So I think that there is some breed relationship with it and definitely a species relationship. Clearly cats are not given a hundred years of kidney life. Dogs are not given a hundred years of kidney life. But what if cats are actually given 30 years? What if dogs are actually given 25 years and we're shortening that because we're doing things wrong along the way? So, um, you know, there's just so much that we don't know, um, yeah. but we're learning. Yeah. And, and so, yes, you can do, I've had clients very holistic, do everything right. And their dogs get a nasty, horrible cancer and die at five. Oh. And you have to look at that and say, why? Yeah. why? And of course it's human nature. We always kick ourselves. What should I have done differently? I should have, I should have done something differently. Yeah. Who knows? It just, it, it, I was, you don't know this, but I mean, I had just lost her when I talked to you. I mean, it was, I think two days, mm. three days into it. So it was just, I, just wanted to thank you for that. But we, we do do that. We definitely put the guilt on ourselves. And one of the things I always say, and we can talk a little bit about this, but I know you have a lot of things that you talk about. If you want to have the healthiest pet, there's, I think, how many do you list? Three, five? Well, my, my three main things that if you want to have your healthiest pet, you're going to feed a whole food diet that is appropriate for your pet's personality, breed. So the Chinese medicine incorporates a lot more than just here, feed them, you know, meat and organs and bones and stuff, uh, because you can actually tailor the diet. And that's what this book is. That book is about the, (laughs) um, it's about tailoring the diet for your pet's specific personality, because for instance, if they're a metal personality, that's ruled by the lung and the large intestine. Well, they might, all my gray cats have had asthma because they're metal personalities and that's the lungs. So we can predict they're going to be more prone to asthma. That's why the, the Chinese medicine is really cool. So anyway, so the first most important thing is food. Food really is the foundation of life. You are what you eat, eat something good. Uh, second, we've got to minimize the vaccines. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I am a minimalist vaccinator. So, um, and I have a lot of clients who never vaccinated their animals and they live long, healthy lives. I have others where the animals were vaccinated almost to death and they still lived a long, healthy life. But uh, there's a lot of genetics that plays into that. And then the third thing is minimizing all these chemicals, particularly the pesticides that we're throwing at our pets because uh, they get exposed to enough chemicals in the environment. There's enough environmental pollution in our water, in our air yeah. in Orange County. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and in, in the foods that we're eating. Uh, so we want to minimize that as much as possible. So th- those are my three main things that I tell people to really sit down and look at. What am I feeding my pet? Am I putting something really good and healthy in that bowl? Even if I'm not feeding for personality, am I putting something really good and healthy in that bowl? Um, you know, am I taking them out and getting them some exercise? Am I entertaining them mentally? There's so many things that go into the overall lifestyle, but um, certainly not putting a bunch of toxins into their body, food, vaccines, chemicals. If we can detoxify them, yeah. by getting as much of that out as possible. And again, that's going to be an individualized program for every pet. I cannot make a blanket statement that no one should ever give heartworm preventative. If I lived in the Mississippi Delta where heartworms are rampant, I'd look at things a lot differently than if I lived in Nova Scotia where they don't exist. So I can't make a blanket statement. I cannot tell people, and this is where being an integrated veterinarian helps because sometimes I feel like when we're labeled as a holistic veterinarian, that means we have to be way over on this side of the spectrum, um, which means that I can never touch a medication. And I do have people who criticize me for for saying things like, well, your dog might need heartworm preventative. Um, 
But I'm not going to be the person that tells you, oh, you live in Mississippi and you're not, and you shouldn't give heartworm preventative and then your dog gets heartworms. Yeah. You're not going to be very happy with me. Yeah. I don't want that on my shoulders. Right. Right. (laughs) No, it's true because, you know, that's why I stock vets because I also don't want, you know, a veterinarian who refuses to use anything conventional because I think that can be dangerous also. So I, I really like the veterinarians who understand, like integrative. Can you explain a little bit to our listeners what, what it means to be integrative? So it means that first, I'm, well, I like to say that you cannot be a good holistic veterinarian if you weren't a good traditional veterinarian <laughs> first. Um, you have to, when you go to vet school, you're going to get all that traditional training and you need to understand that. I need to understand the anatomy, the physiology, how things work. Uh, then when I learned Chinese medicine, I kind of, it was like going back to vet school and learning it in a different I, language. I bet. Very, very, very weird for me. Um, and it took a long, long time to kind of, synthesize all that. Um, So we learn everything from a traditional standpoint. There are no veterinary schools, at least not in this country, that are teaching only alternative therapies. Some of them are incorporating a little bit, uh, which is nice. I'm happy to see that. Uh, But as an integrated veterinarian, we have all the tools at our disposal that you would have at a traditional veterinary office. So I'm a huge fan of diagnostics. I love sure. lab work. I love ultrasounds. I love echocardiograms. I love x-rays. I make people a little crazy because I'm like, nope, you need another test. Yeah, good but, for you. Uh, you know, all those endocrine tests that are out there. I, I think we need all of that. We need to understand what's going on inside the body. Yeah. And then we take all of that information and we look at it and say, well, how are we going to treat this animal? And this is where the holistic side of me comes in because I might look at a dog, for instance, who has Cushing's disease and I'll look at him and go, well, he's panting. He's drinking a lot. Well, he's got heat. He's hot. How do we put out that fire? Oh, these are some nice cooling herbs that I can use to help put out that fire. This is how I can change his diet to make that more energetically cooling. So I don't look at it and just say, oh, well, here's your medicine. Take this pill. It'll, you know, kill off the adrenal glands and then he won't have the symptoms of Cushing's anymore. I look at it and say, no, we have to treat this dog from all the different directions. So we want to stop putting anything into the body that's going to add heat. We want to cool this dog, whether that's going to be with herbs, with diet, with uh, supplements, with vitamins. There's so many things in my toolbox. Uh, A dog who has, I keep saying dog, but we do this for cats too. Um, A dog that has intervertebral disc disease. Well, was he hot and panting before that happened? Was he cold and not moving before that happened? I'm going to choose different herbs based on what his symptoms were. It's not all disc disease is the same. It's very different. And we have to look at the lifestyle of the animal. Is this an animal that could live in a cart? Is this a dog that we should try to send to surgery? Can the owner handle this dog if it needs to have its bladder expressed? So holistic veterinarians are going to look at the whole picture, not even just the animal. We have to include the family in that. Can the family care for this pet? Uh, My mother's standard schnauzer, 50-pound dog lived to be 17 and a half. Wow. Well, for the last year of that dog's life, she needed a lot of help getting around. My mother is a hundred pounds soaking wet. So <laughs> we've got a 50 pound dog, a hundred pound owner, who's pretty strong, but so we had to look at how could we make this work for everyone and not have that dog just be down with pressure sores. Well, we got ramps. We got help them up harnesses. We got foot uh, booties to give the dog a little more traction. We changed a lot of her supplements to make it so that she had less inflammation and could get around better. We have to look at things from a whole. You can't just say, oh, here's your Rimadyl. Good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's exactly why it's really hard to find a good integrative veterinarian because I think a lot of times, at least my experience has been, I find an integrative veterinarian and there's, they're not really integrative because they're not understanding how to look at the whole. They're still only looking at one part. The dog has kidney failure. 
but they're not looking at exactly the environment, the family, the situation, every single dog. The diet. diet. Well, yeah, <laughs> of course, diet. And they rarely look at diet. Sometimes the integrative ones will, but they're a little off, I think. So even some of the integrative ones will still say science diet. Here's your prescription yeah, diet. So yeah, they're still doing that. So it's, it, it makes it really hard for me. And those are bets I call ones I don't refer to. But so you get into veterinary school and one we're going to kind of shift here a little bit, but in veterinarian school, is it frowned upon to use herbalism or holistic medication, or is that something that they, they want in there? Is it, is it any of it taught there? It's very individualized and it depends a lot on the school. So for instance, the veterinary school in Florida, they have Dr. Shea, who started, he's from China. He started the Chi Institute in Florida. He's very close to the school. So they actually have a rotation in traditional Chinese veterinary medicine as part of the student's rotation. So the students coming from there very commonly will then get certified in acupuncture and herbs. People who live in Florida and say to me, I can't find a holistic veterinarian. I'm like, are you crazy? There's a, they have more per capita than anyone else because the Gene Institute is there. So it's so much easier for people to train there. But I think he's trained it's, the number is probably much higher, but I, I, last I saw it was something like 40,000 veterinarians. There's a lot wow. of veterinarians who have trained in acupuncture. Not all, And part of the problem is that um, acupuncture is sort of a buzzword. And like, for instance, where I practiced, we had five or six practices within a 10 mile radius. And almost every one of them had somebody who did acupuncture on their staff. Oh, but just because they do acupuncture does not mean that they support raw feeding or that they are going to minimize vaccines or that they are not going to recommend uh, pesticides. So that's part of the, the, the problem in the mix. Um, the, P- veterinarians can be listed on AHVMA, which is the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, um, as you know, being a member, but, and, and they have to put in there what they do, whether it's chiropractic, acupuncture, food therapy, supplements, whatever. And so sometimes you'll find what's considered a holistic veterinarian on that list. And then you walk in the office and they do acupuncture, but they're also trying to get you to do six vaccines. They're prescribing science diet or Royal Cane and pick one. Um, and they're also sending you home with your oral flea and tick pesticides. And it's sort of like, wow, uh, I kind of came here for holistic medicine and I got acupuncture. That was good. Yeah. And the rest of it made me want to, you know, run yeah. screaming. So uh, you have to, you, you have to ask a lot of questions. A lot of questions. And be willing to stand your ground yeah. is uh, really what it boils down to. When you walk in and you say, I'm here for acupuncture, and they say, well, you have to do these six things to stand your ground and say, uh, that's no. <laughs> yeah. No, I tell people all that. It's sad, really, that we have to stand our ground. But you're right. You have to stand your ground. I, I tell my clients that all the time. You're, you're going to have to go in knowing, setting yourself up knowing what the responses are going to be because they're going to come at you. I've been, I had a veterinarian go off on me one time because I wouldn't give a dog a Bordetella vaccine and she just could not accept that. And so it became an issue. And, but I, I looked at it from a different standpoint for my clients. Cause I thought, Oh my God, is this what they're dealing with? Because I gave her very well thought out, but most people can't do that. I'm inundated with this. So, but she still fought me on it. So you have to be prepared. You have to do that. So, yes. so would you, I mean, I think based off of that, what you just talked about with the school in Florida, it's probably important to pick a veterinarian, probably based on what school they went to. Right. So yes and no, uh, we're getting a few more veterinary schools now, but there's still not that many. So not the New Jersey doesn't have a veterinary school, so we go wherever we can get in. Um, but for instance, I have a good friend in Michigan. She went to Michigan State, uh, but she's already done all of her acupuncture training. And she's she's also a licensed pharmacist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of school. Um, but um, there are a lot of students who are, as a matter of fact, I interviewed a vet student, a senior vet student from Georgia a few years back, um, and she had already done her acupuncture training. So they, a lot of them 
want to do it and they're learning that along with their traditional training the, the, and they're pretty much going to Florida to get that training. Uh, the problem is when they get hired or for instance, uh, all these clinics around me that had an acupuncturist on staff. Well, if there's eight doctors in the practice, one does acupuncture, guess what? If the other seven aren't referring to the acupuncturist in the practice, they're not going to be getting much of that clientele anyway. It was really interesting to me, that particular doctor, she had worked for me at one time and was working five miles up the road. She did acupuncture, she did chiropractic. I would have so many clients come to me from that clinic and say, we're here because we want acupuncture and chiropractic. And I'd say, do you know that they have somebody in the clinic that you've been going to that does that? They do? I didn't know that. So if you're not even promoting it in your own clinic and you have somebody there doing it, you don't understand it. Well, it's really bad salesmanship. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bad advertising. Like yeah. put that all over your website. Um, but it was amazing how many people came to me because they didn't know that they even had it at their clinic. Um, and good for me when they would come, they would always stay. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> well, because they like that we really walk the walk. Yeah. Um, it, when we, of course, when you're doing chiropractic and acupuncture on the animal and you're sitting there for a few minutes with the needles cooking, you're going to start talking about everything else. And so we would start talking about our vaccination protocols and our um, uh, thoughts on preventatives and food. And uh, then people really understood that, no, this isn't, I'm not just here for acupuncture. I'm here for, for the whole thing. Yeah. No, walk the walk is exactly I, I can't stress that enough because that's one of the things I, a, a simple test I tell people because it's hard to go through all the questions, but I say one of the simple tests is when you walk into a holistic veterinarian hospital and on the walls is all the flea and tick medications they're going to sell you, that's, you should turn around and walk back out because that's a pretty good indication that you're not in the right realm. <laughs> Sorry, cat at the door. That's okay. Um, it is, but I have an interesting story about that. I have a, a client in Ohio who she was trying to find, she was trying to find a clone of me. And <laughs> we all uh, are trying so to find she, a clone of you. <laughs> <laughs> so she, um, she had uh, gone online and looked at all the different clinics and she found one that had a holistic veterinarian. So she said, oh, I'm, I'm going to make an appointment. So she made her appointment, drove her hour to get there. And she walks in and it was exactly what you said. There was, you know, prescription diets on all the shelves yeah. and these big posters advertising all these chemicals. And she just, she, you know, the eyes got big and she said, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. And then she thought, well, I made this appointment, so I'm going to stay and I'm going to meet the doctor. So she got into the exam room with her dog and this youngish doctor walks in and uh, they start to talk. And my client pulls out this book the <laughs> from needles to natural book. And of course it's got all of its little, you know, post-its and highlights and everything. <laughs> just, <laughs> they're going to have a conversation about this. And the vet goes, Oh my gosh, wait a minute. Runs out of the room, comes running back in with her copy oh, of the book. Yay. And so, you know, of course the client just kind of melts at that point and says, oh, I'm in the right place. Yeah. Um, so what she found is, yes, there was a holistic doctor within this practice. Yeah. She was the only one who was holistic. The rest of the practice was doing all that other stuff. Um, and so the client just said, look, if I'm going to come here, can I absolutely see you? Because I don't want to talk about all those things that are out there. I want to talk about the stuff that's in here. And uh, she said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it ended up being a match made in heaven. And then that veterinarian ended up going out and starting her own holistic oh, practice. Oh, good, so good, good. It all worked I out. I actually have, we, we do have a vet here in Orange County, Dr. Ann Coney, and she was working in a practice that was not holistic and sold science diet and just food for dogs and all of these foods. Um, but I would always tell my clients, just when you get there, just put your blinders on and get into her <laughs> and to get into her office. So that can happen because not everybody wants to be a business owner. And, but what is, but I, what I will say out of respect for the veterinarian that owns her clinic, at least he was willing to say, if that's what you want to do, then I'll accept it and let you do it. So that I thought yeah. was, you know, really great, even though I don't necessarily believe in it and I don't do that. I do see the benefit of it. So that was pretty awesome. Yes. So yeah, I thought that absolutely. was you know, something to do. So let's, um, I, so I want to talk about something that I think is, um, so profound and not a lot of people know this. 
I did not know this. In with all my stalking, somehow it got past me. But I recently found out that you don't use your veterinarian license anymore. Can you tell us how that came about and and why you do that? There's a lot of reasons. Um, although it's been kind of coming for at least five years. Um, I practiced for 37 years and 37 years of, I don't know, 20 plus clients a day that are actually coming in the door plus surgery on top of that emergencies, blah, blah, blah. I worked in emergency, uh, work for 10 years. Absolutely loved it. Wow. I, you've got to be young and energetic to do that. <laughs> long, I, would go in, hours. I would do emergency if I was a vet. I love that. Yeah. Long, hard hours, but I loved it at the time. Um, so I was getting really worn down. Um, the, the, I mean, some of these clients, I had had them for multiple generations of their pets. Um, and it, it, it gets hard. Um, uh, I get attached to them <laughs> and, uh, it's like losing so many of your own yeah. friends and pets, um, over the years. But, um, those actually did not bother me. And my, my wonderful clients did not bother me. It was people getting more demanding. Um, we, we've gone through different financial hardships, the 2008, 2009 sure. oh, crash, um, you know, COVID, uh, when people don't have money and they can't afford to have veterinary care done. And I was not the cheapest clinic. As a matter of fact, I was probably the most expensive clinic around, but I had a lot of experience and I was offering something different from what everybody else was. Uh, but it gets really hard when people are yelling at you and saying, if you loved animals, you do it for free. You're, and those are the people who have no problem with going on Yelp and going on Google and giving you a zero star review and screaming about you. And it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter how right or how wrong you were in the situation. You can't refute it. You nope. can't go online. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the online presence, I think has made it much more difficult for veterinarians and the veterinary suicide rate is through the roof. And this is part of the reason because, um, we get blamed, you know, we had clients who would just adopt animal after animal after animal to the point where they were almost hoarders and they couldn't afford one, let alone 20. And it was always our fault. Yeah. And, um, uh, it really is probably less than 5% of your clients are obnoxious, Yeah, but those 5% are the ones that go to bed with you at night. Yep. Those 5% Every night. are the ones that make you cry. Yep. Those are the ones that keep you away from your family and your children. Um, so it was 37 years is a long time where it just, it got more and more difficult. And then also being the practice owner and having to worry about caring for the families of my 13 staff members and making sure that they were paid well. Well, in order for them to be paid well and support their families, that means, you know, our fees had to keep up with that. Uh, things that have changed in, you know, from a governmental standpoint, as far as taxes, health care, health insurance costs through the roof. When I first started in practice, the average net of, of your gross income was 40%. And I had an evaluation done of my clinics years ago, and we were at 11%. It's hard to survive, yeah. really hard to survive. And it was getting, you know, the drug costs were going through the roof. It was just getting very hard to keep all those balls in the air and juggling them. And then, you know, silly me, I opened a second clinic in <laughs> 2011. So now I'm trying to juggle, you know, running back and forth between two and juggling the staffs of two. Um, I had an awesome office manager. Thank God. I still, I still am working with my office manager up in New Jersey. Um, and then COVID came along and COVID totally changed the way we practice. I was hoping to get out within the next couple of years anyway. COVID hit us in March. Um, and in the first week that COVID hit, three of my staff members went out. Um, and at the time, 
I mean, here we are, we're struggling to pay the bills anyway. Um, and we were a very successful practice and we were struggling. So I was like, man, how are those bottom feeders doing? Like they're like, how are they surviving? Um, but the first few weeks during COVID, my staff of 13 was down to four. Me, a receptionist, a tech and my office manager. And, uh, and part of it was some were sick and the rest were scared. Yeah. And so they all wanted to stay home. And as the practice owner, I paid everybody who stayed home. Oh. So I spent three weeks with no staff and full payroll. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. It really was. Uh, and then luckily my, my daughter got pregnant and said, I'm having a baby in North Carolina. And I said, yay, moving to North Carolina. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was, it was on the horizon. It just, the, it got moved up. Uh, so COVID kind of helped yeah. spur things. And then I just, I got, I had talked to a bunch of different corporations about buying my practices and frankly, corporate did not want my practices because they were holistic. Did not want them. They don't want that holistic. Uh, the The biggest owner of veterinary practices right now is Mars Pep, Mars Candy. I know, <laughs> which is Mars Pep food. So, um, so they don't want it right. certainly. Uh, and I've never said anything good about them. So why? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a million dollars. Thanks for yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I got really lucky. My associate, who had been working with me for the past five years, um, decided that she would step up to the plate and she would buy the clinics and I made her the deal of the century because I wanted her to carry on my legacy. And I'm hearing from people that she's doing a phenomenal job yes. carrying on my legacy. She does acupuncture, uh, chiropractic. She's into the titers. She does not have a problem with raw feeding. They use this book in the practice all the time. Mm. Um, so I, it was, it was just sort of everything came together at the same time. I had somebody willing to take over the legacy. My daughter needed help in North Carolina. Um, my brain was fried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And frankly, teaching the way that I do now with my Facebook lives, my blogs, my books, I can reach a lot more people and I can save a lot more lives than doing them one by one right. in the clinic. Um, so I, I still, as a matter of fact, I had a phone conversation yesterday with one of my friends from New Jersey who had taken her dog in for lab work. And she said, I don't understand everything they told me. Okay. You, can I talk to you? Yeah. I was like, of course you can. You've been my client for 30 years Aww. and, uh, you know, I love you. She's a good friend. She's coming down to visit. So, um, you know, I, I still love talking to the, the clients that I made friends with. Yeah. Um, yeah. but the, the long-term chronic cases that are, that you just can't seem to fix them. And part of the problem with that is social media. Mm -hmm. There are social, and I know this is one of the things you and I talked about, but there are social media sites that are just like, oh, just stop vaccinating them, feed them all raw and the allergies will go away and they'll be cured. And they'll never have another problem. And the arthritis will be all gone. You know, just, just feed this raw food. They'll be great. Yeah. 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 It's not that easy folks. Yeah, and not. if your dog has had uh, horribly itchy yeast infected skin, for, with allergic to everything for six years, no, you're not going to cure it in 10 minutes. No. And so the expectations were getting um, very difficult. And as a veterinarian, let me tell you, everything that we do gets second guessed on social media. Uh, you can go on any site. Well, my vet said I should do this. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, no, it does. I, I <laughs> it, it absolutely does. My vet says, but what do you think the girl who only owns a Chihuahua once in her whole life? What's your, <laughs> could you start? We, I, Dr. Morgan knows I told her I wanted to talk about these Facebook groups, but before we do, because I think that's such an important topic. <laughs> I don't know if somebody replays this video. When you started talking about the suicide rates in veterinary medicine and the Yelp reviews and the 5%, which I agree, I own a business. I have 25 employees right now. And when you started, if you replayed this, I started to tear up a little bit because I had to like take a deep breath because it, and I'm going to do it now. I'm such a baby in my old age. I don't know why, but it breaks my heart that we have such amazing people in this industry who want to quit because of the attacks, the, the expectations of what they want from you. Um, and you are so very, very right. Those people who spend 15 minutes on Yelp blasting you, 
don't realize that that will sit with you for weeks, months, years. I still remember the first bad Yelp review I got, and it was at least eight years ago, nine years ago. And I still think about it to this day. And you're absolutely right. We can't, no matter what we do, right or wrong, no matter how we respond to it, we come off as defensive and somebody hates that you do that. And it, and it's causing, and especially, I don't want to say especially because I don't have any scientific proof to prove this, but I feel like the holistic veterinarian is more intuitive and more, um, I don't know the word, sensitive maybe. And so we're losing those veterinarians because they're they're sensitive to losing a pet or not being able to help a pet and then you go and attack them and then you go about your life like it like so i just it breaks my heart that that was one of the reasons one of the not all of but one of the defining reasons that would make you want to say I, i'm not going to do this though i am also very happy that it led you down a path that's allowing you to help more people so more dogs, more cats. So yeah, that that path got started uh, about 2014, and it has grown. Yeah. Um. So that's that was when the first book was written. It came out, I think, August of 2014, and um. So I, that's when I started my DVM Facebook page and started trying to help educate people more. And I just discovered over the years that I really, I guess there's a lot of my mom in me because I really like teaching. Yeah. I really me like too. teaching. I love teaching. Um, I yeah. Been. So, and I, I think uh, the more education we give to pet parents, the better lives the pets are going to have, but also the more they are going to challenge the veterinary profession yeah. to um, stay on top of their game and be compassionate. And I think, uh, again, you're right. Where's that 13 year old child who wanted to save the turtle crossing the road. Yeah. Um, by the time you get through eight years of college and you're $250,000 in debt, um, and you've, you may be working for a corporation that gives you a quota that you have to meet every month. Um, it, you can kind of lose sight of that. Yeah. And I think that has a, a lot to do yeah, it does. And our suicide rate. It really does. It does. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. So let's, let's shift a little bit and let's talk about Facebook. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't complain about it because know, uh, it's, right? it's been really good to me professionally. And I'm like, yes, man, I've got 75,000 followers on Facebook. I wouldn't want to have to rebuild that platform yeah. from anywhere. No, you really um, don't. I actually had a lot of, I lost mine. I had, I, it like died one, it, you know, had it for years and I lost my whole thing. And, uh, Lori, who is fabulous and she owns a company called allied exchange. There's a plug for her. Cause I promise you, if you want someone to help you in the background, it's great, but she had to set up a whole new account and I had to start all <laughs> over and it was just devastating <laughs> and there was no way to get it back, but it's a love hate relationship for sure. Um, clients will come to me and I say, Oh, well, cause I, I, uh, I'm a, admin for some Facebook groups. And I'll say, well, join this group. And they say, oh, I'm not on Facebook. And I usually say, well, good for you. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I know that it can, you know, I just had a woman this morning, we were trying to give her some advice because she was feeding Karina to her dog. And I, I was so kind. I am a very kind person, but you can push my buttons. They can be pushed, but I am, I want to teach. And so I'm trying to help her understand that there are better choices. And her response to me, she gets mad and says, whatever. Oh my God, I'm just trying to help you. So, but Facebook, there's so many groups, right? And they start these groups that might say raw feeding. And then the person who started it believes the answer, you already alluded to this, is the answer to everything is raw feeding. And then if you try to give any information, like you so beautifully said it, your dog has allergies, feed him raw, and it all goes away and everything's happy and hunky-dory. And then when it doesn't work for you, this is the problem, right? When it doesn't work for you, you go tell everybody raw sucks. It didn't work <laughs> <laughs> because it didn't work for you. So you have a Facebook group that you said a fabulous fan started for you. What is that called? Oh, so yeah, my page is Judy Morgan DVM. Right. Uh, but. Um, it's a convoluted story, but this uh, woman, Denise Newland, was living in Georgia at the time, and she 
sent me an email or a Facebook message. I don't even know how she got a hold of me. And she said, hey, I found this new pet food company right around the corner from me in Georgia. And it's a raw pet food company. Can you look at their ingredients and tell me if it's any good? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I did. And the company was all provide. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, Denise looks pretty good. They're using all human grade ingredients. And, you know, it's low in carb content. You know, a lot of things I liked. I said, but if I was going to do it, I would do it a little bit differently. Um, but I like what they're doing. And she said, is this okay to feed my dogs? I said, looks good to me. But if you want to hook me up with the people at the company, I'd be happy to talk to them. Yeah. So over time, uh, I ended up, I was going to Georgia. And so I told them I was coming down for a meeting and they said, Hey, you want to stop by and have lunch? And I was like, yeah, these are the owners of the company because you know, we'd been chit chatting. And when I got there, I found out that every little tidbit of information that I had ever put in an email, like, well, if I was going to do it, I would change this or I would do that or I would do this. They did all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and like on their website, it says, you know, formulation was helped by Dr. Judy oh. Morgan. I'm like, I didn't even know I was doing that at the time, but okay. Yeah. And I've yeah. worked with them a lot since then, but, um, but anyway, so Denise, I guess because I helped her out with this whole food, I don't even know how, I guess she started <laughs> following me on my Facebook page. And so she started this group friends. I think it's friends, friends of, of Judy Morgan. Judy Morgan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was like, where'd that come from? And somebody in New Jersey started a similar one, but it never got any traction. Well, Denise just kept plugging away at this yeah. thing. And I don't know, she's got like 5,000 people she on there. A lot. And my daughter is an admin on there now. And my daughter is now running my company. Uh, Dr. Judy Morgan is naturally healthy pets. And, um, so it's ended up being a great discussion group. Um, because it, basically they're not allowed to talk about things that they're not my philosophy. Like they're not allowed Good. to recommend somebody else's. Well, not with your on name there. on it. <laughs> right. And I'm like, it's not even my site, but it does have my name on it. Yeah, so there's, it. you know, there's a couple of times when I've gone in and deleted a couple of things because I'm like, eh. um, but Denise is, uh, Denise and my daughter, uh, Denise is really good. Like she, she is on top of it all the time. Like if people are, are getting in fights or, oh, they do. or being rude, she's like, you're out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's just easier. Sometimes it's just, it's just easier to kick them out. The woman this morning on the one that I'm an admin for, I let her stay in because I thought it was going to be a good learning experience for everybody. Um, because you've probably heard this argument a lot. My dog ate X brand that you and I both know is we would never feed our animals. And he lived to be 17 years old. And that means it's a good food, right? Because he lived to be a certain age. And that was what she was trying to say is that her dog's been eating Purina and her, she has a 17 year old lab and he's healthy. But the definition of healthy is very broad for a lot of people. It's, it is. And the food has changed over the yeah. years. What was being put out 20 years ago is very different from what is being put out now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, exactly. But to me, I mean, even the, the nutritional content in the food that we, because our soils have been depleted, right? The, the, there's a lot more toxins in the soils. Even the food that we eat is so different than what it, was, it was when people had their own family farms. And yeah. I, I, I have my own family farm this year and I am working my butt off trying to make that soil better and trying to organically keep bugs out of my garden. Let me tell you, I know about more bug pests <laughs> on plants than I ever wanted to know. And I'm out there spraying beneficial bacteria and bugs. And oh my God. I would love to see a picture. And... Send me pictures of your farm. I love that. I need to move out of Orange County someday. I can't. The garden is beautiful, but like, it, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And I, I said, you know, my goal here, silly me. Like, oh, I'll put enough food in the freezer. We'll have all the veggies and tomato sauce and everything we need for the whole winter. Yeah. We're going to be lucky if we get enough out of this. And it's 2,000 square feet. Oh, it's wow. not a tiny garden. Wow. <laughs> so we're going to be lucky if we get enough to just, you know, have a few meals over the summer. <laughs> we got one this strawberry. Oh, my God. I, that's, this is hard. That's my dream. I want to do that. My son lives in Oregon, and he has a farm, and he loves he loves growing vegetables, and all. he's just so into it. I do, too. I'll get better at it. I, I, I'm in a Facebook group called Row by Row. Anybody who's gardening out there, Row by Row, man, I'm learning. Like, you can post a picture of your plant or the bug, and everybody's like, oh, it's this. Treat it with this. Oh, I gotta look. I'm going to do it. Row by Row. That's what a great name. Row by Row. What a great name. So awesome. Facebook Facebook groups. What would you say is the worst part about that? 
the dangers. I, I don't want to say the worst part, but it can be very, very dangerous, dangerous when you have. It is dangerous. So I I see posts so often. I I try try not to be on Facebook too much. But I have to be on Facebook because I get I get angry. Um, I'll see somebody post something, you know, sort of like my cat's been straining in the litter box for two days. What do you think it could be? Which homeopathic medication should I use? And I'm like, your cat's obstructed. Yeah. He can't pee. He's going into kidney failure. He'll be dead tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe you should get to the veterinarian. Maybe you should not be asking your neighbor or the guy on the other side of the country yeah. who doesn't even own cats, but is happy to give you an opinion. It's very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got animals spewing blood from different orifices and people are like, what do you think I should treat them with at home? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's blood. I think maybe we should be going to the emergency clinic or calling our veterinarian or text your veterinarian a picture of what's coming out. Something. Yeah. But let's ask somebody with professional knowledge, not the first person that posted. answers on a Facebook group. The yeah. person, Somebody posted something about a dog shaking his head and scratching at his ear a little bit, said it looked clean. Um, and the answers that she got were everything from yeast, bacteria, ear mites, allergies, and 75 different treatments. Yeah. And I'm like, or we should maybe take the dog in and get a look down in the ear and see what's actually going yeah, on. Yeah, there could be a foxtail in there. There could be a tumor. Exactly. There could be... The kitchen sink. I don't know, but there could be something in there. It's so right. I know for one of the groups I'm on, people will ask questions and I'm the first, I, I'll give you some professional advice. Usually it is to go to the vet, but I need pictures. You can't just say here is the situation. You didn't even post a picture. I can't, I need to see it before I can tell you whether I think you should, you know, I, like I've had people say, my dog's not overweight. He, like, cause I'll start asking questions and, I'll, and they'll say, no, he's not overweight. He's this, he's that. And I'll say, can I see a picture of him? Like his whole body. And then they send the picture. I'm like, geez, <laughs> he's obese uh, by a lot. And so, and that's maybe why he's limping. <laughs> you know, it's just like that. We might have more than one thing to work on here. <laughs> right. Exactly. But I, it, I worry so much. I, I told you when we had our pre-conversation about how I got kicked out of a Facebook group because I suggested they take the dog to a veterinarian. It was just, I think at this, like, not at this point, your dog needs to see a veterinarian. And when you have a full diagnosis that you're comfortable with, whether that requires one vet, two vets, or a third opinion, whatever that is, if you want my opinion from that point, I'd be happy to give it to you. But, and I got kicked out. Like, we don't recommend veterinarians here. I mean, they're bold. They don't, we do not recommend veterinarians. And yeah, uh, I think that's dangerous. I think that's really dangerous. You know, my dog is coughing. What herb should I give? Well, what's the diagnosis? Why is he coughing? Yeah. Because if that's a dog in heart failure and somebody just says, give him a raw diet and, yeah. you know, give him honey. Yeah. Uh, and that dog was in heart failure and didn't get to a veterinarian because they were busy giving honey or whatever right. for the cough. I mean, when, when people want to do a consultation with me, a uh, phone consultation or Zoom now, um, I will not take them unless they have at least a year's worth of veterinary records. Good. And awesome. I get people who say, I don't take my dog to the veterinarian. I want to do a consultation with you. I'm like, well, I can't do a physical exam over Zoom and you're not giving me physical exam notes from a professional. I can't do that. And if you don't have lab work, if you don't have diagnostics, I've got nothing to work with. That is unprofessional. I won't talk to you. I cannot diagnose, prescribe, or treat an animal that I am not in the physical presence of with an intact veterinary license in the state that I am seeing the animal. So I will not do that. But I will be more than happy to look at veterinary records and tell you what I see. And it's amazing how many little things I pick up and that the owners weren't even aware of. Like, did you know when your dog was at the office, your veterinarian gave him a dose of NexGuard? What? Uh, I would never allow that. Well, did you look at your receipt? Because uh, it's on there. Um, did you know that your dog got 16 vaccines in one day? What? I didn't even know he got any vaccines. Look at your receipt. Um, so there's a lot of things that we pick up. You know, I, I will look through records and say, why is your dog getting a rabies vaccine every single year? He is? Yeah, yeah he is. Why? 
I didn't know he was gay. So I'm perfectly willing to look at records. I'm perfectly willing to look at lab work and look at the symptoms that the animal has and then recommend additional testing or, um, well, these are the medications I used in practice. I cannot prescribe them for your pet but you might want to ask your veterinarian about this alternative since he's not doing well with the medication that was prescribed. This is another alternative. Maybe go have that conversation. So, but if you, if they're not getting a diagnosis or at least some diagnostics done to try to work toward that diagnosis, I can't, yeah. I can't be hopeful. It would be illegal yeah. <laughs> to do that for one thing. Um, but I, it, it would not be good information. And so when we're seeing these Facebook posts with, well, he's, he's been limping. Somebody emailed me the other day. They said, my dog's been limping by looking at the anatomy. I've narrowed it down to the, to the <laughs> elbow. Okay. By looking at the okay. anatomy, it's the elbow. Okay. She looked at an anatomy uh, uh, diagram online yeah. and decided it was the elbow. And I said, well, we might need to look at his neck. Maybe he's got a disc problem in his neck that's sending, you know, nerve shooting pains down the leg. Maybe he's got a chip in his shoulder or his elbow. Maybe he twisted. I don't know. Right. But right. I think we need some diagnostics. Right. <laughs> but that kind of a, that kind of an email could turn into a post. And I think that years ago it used to be, I've opened my, my business has been around for 21 years. So when I first opened it and a website, if you had a website, then you, then you knew what you were doing. Like you, it, it <laughs> gave you credibility because you had a website. And that's all you needed. Oh, they have a website, you would hear. They have a website. And how dangerous is that? And then it got kind of changed. The websites became, everybody has a website, so whatever. And each step of the way, and now it's they have a podcast. And, you know, I'm making fun and I have a podcast. But it's true. Like, people are like, you have a podcast? Oh, my, you must know everything. No, I don't know everything. That's just because I have a podcast or just because I'm on TV or just because I have a Facebook group. And I can't tell you how many people, how easy it is to open a Facebook, how very little needs to be done to do it. And it is so dangerous and it breaks my heart. I see it all the time where I just, I, there needs to be something done. I don't know what we can do about it, except keep educating people about the risks of taking information. I just shared with you how we had a dog on on savings pets and she just wanted to keep asking us questions and we're trying to tell her your dog might have blockage get to the vet and he didn't make it he didn't make it so but i just think god what if somebody else would have said because he was vomiting right he's got this, this he's vomiting and so a lot of times i'll see that on a my dog's vomiting what do i do oh we'll feed him you know raw diet yeah. see if he'll eat this oh he doesn't like Give that him yeah he doesn't like this he doesn't like that he doesn't so just keep trying different foods he's sick <laughs> you know it's not always that so i'm glad we're talking a little bit about facebook groups because it's it, it's something that's no it's not just face i mean it's on, it's on all social media sure sure it's, sure yeah I mean, yeah i happen to use facebook as my main social media platform but it's yeah. on all social media yeah. i do um, too i use it but it, you're right it's every you can next door the next door app. Oh my gosh. I almost feel like the next door app is even more dangerous because it's, I haven't even been on that one. Oh, don't start. <laughs> don't start. But I get, stuff. I don't need another. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, like don't start. Cause once you get that, cause I get stuff on the next door app and I'm like, what? So the neighbor said this, do they even have a dog? It's, you know, the neighbor will go, well, my neighbor six doors down said that her chihuahua <laughs> next thing you know. So, um, so Dr. Morgan had mentioned that she's, um, not using her license, but you're still able to do consultations and uh, people can reach out to you. How do they, how do they reach out to you? What are some of the ways they can get a hold of you? So um, the easiest way is through my website, which is drjudymorgan.com. Very simple. Okay. Uh, you can email us through the website. I think the consultations are actually listed in the web store, but where it's as a product and where it's listed in the web store, it basically says email info at drjudymorgan.com. Yeah. Um, because uh, we get so many requests and I actually stopped them for a while and people were just going nuts. Um, uh, we get so many requests that I can't do them all. So uh, we actually found two other integrated veterinarians who are doing online consultations. And so uh, we have three of us oh, that are splitting amazing. the work now, which is making life a lot 
better yeah. for us. Yeah. Um, because I, I only have so many hours and so many brain cells that, <laughs> that I can use in a day. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. That's good though, that you have, you have the two coming on board with you and just found, just found them. It was actually because I said I wasn't doing them anymore. And a client from Michigan said, no, I, I really want a consultation. I said, let me see if I can, she said, can you recommend anybody else? I said, let me see if I can find somebody. I actually Googled believe it or not, it worked, uh, and found somebody and then called her up and had an hour long conversation and, uh, loved her. And then she sent me a sample of one of her reports from a consultation she had done. I was like, wow, you are really thorough. This is awesome. Yeah. So I asked her if she would take referrals from us and she said, yes. And she said, yeah, funny thing is a classmate of mine just called me up and she wants to join me and do consultations too. I'm like, that's even better. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I have to send all of my clients to you guys because we don't have um a really good integrative veterinarian very close to me we have dr jean dodds who's close and she has oh, two yeah. veterinarians working she's close but one of the things that can be frustrating is people really want that convenience and so garden she's in garden grove which is probably uh, at best a 30 minute drive and they still don't want to do it. So I end up saying, okay, then here, make this phone call. You're going to have to do a phone consultation. So I'm so thankful that I'm so afraid of technology. I hate technology. I'm so bad at it, but I'm so thankful that now we can do this because without it, it was much harder to get because for whatever reason, most of you great people are in Chicago and Florida. Well, we know about Florida. So we know Florida, Yeah, Barbara and and Karen. Yeah. The Chicago group. Yeah. So, you know, we have, but I don't know what's going on in Southern California. I mean, if someone like, like there's a few in California, I think most, uh, I think more, um, LA, San Francisco, San Francisco, Los Angeles. I don't know. We have them here that say they're holistic, (laughs) but they're not in the ballpark that you and I would consider what we're looking for as far as integrative. So um, tell me a little bit about, so Dr. Morgan also, most of you, well, you, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, I know most of you know that I don't sell products on my show. We don't have commercial products. We just don't do that. But there are a lot of products that I do recommend. And Dr. Morgan is got some fabulous products that I just, I want to give you this opportunity, not because I, she's, I'm not making any money. I, it's not that it's just that <laughs> there has to be good products in order for us to help. Can you just share a little bit about some of your products that you do carry? Oh, I think our web store has over 250 products in it right what's now. Your, what's your, many of them are, what's your are, favorites? Uh, what's my favorite? Our, um, our deer, vel- deer antler velvet products are pretty amazing. Okay. Um, the the oral drops are easy for dogs that don't like having their teeth brushed. So a couple drops on the upper gums once a day at bedtime, very simple to do to help keep the, the tartar down and keep the teeth clean. So that was our, our first product that we did. And then the other products, the Wellness and the Senior, are uh, natural sources of glucosamine, chondroitin, hyaluronic acids, and they also stimulate stem cells. So I think it's made a huge difference in our mitral valve disease dogs, the heart disease dogs. Mm -hmm. certainly has made a huge difference in our senior dogs with mobility issues. Um, We've got a lot of products for allergies now. We've got colostrum. We've got uh, the WinPro blood products. Uh, We have a lot of natural shampoos, food supplements. we're even carrying some freeze-dried food right now. Um, we research our products very, very carefully, and uh, we test everything on our own animals and us first uh, mm-hmm. because I'm really looking for human-grade ingredients. Yeah. So uh, pretty much everything that I that is in our store, I would – I would use it on myself yeah, yeah. <laughs> as well as the pets. And I think that's important. It is important. I am car- going to be carrying your products in my store. It's just a little store oh, yeah. in Orange County, but we've already started setting up everything with Gwendolyn. And I do very much like you. I, if I want to, if I want to use a product, um, I will use it 
on, I have used a lot of stuff on myself. People think I'm crazy. I have this one product, which I won't say because I don't want to call out the person who made it. And I actually use it on my face and I love it. But I don't know if she wants me to say that you should use this on humans. So I'm going to just not say that. <laughs> but it, it, I will, I will do stuff like that. And then when I bring in a product, I have one right now that I'm doing testing on that I love. I looked, researched it. I think it's fabulous. And then I find five or six of my clients and I say, Hey, I'm going to give you a free one of these. I want feedback. I didn't create this. So you can tell me if it was the worst thing ever, whatever you want to do. <laughs> and when I do that, then I, then I will bring in a product more permanently. Once I know I've tested some dogs with right. it myself, those kind of things. So I love that you do that. I trust <laughs> that you do that. So when I carry a product from someone like Judy Morgan, it's because of the trust that you know, you stalk someone for two years, you kind of know whether <laughs> whether they have some integrity or not, right? So, well, yeah, you're stalking. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, you got you got to do it, especially because people say they're holistic and they're not really, and they don't. And and I listen, you know, I listen, I listen to some of the podcasts you've done, and I'm I'm looking for, you know, patterns. Like, are, do I have someone who's just jumping on board and wanting to say what they want to say to sell products, or are they? really seriously deep down in this for the love of animals. And that's, that's really what I'm looking at. Cause I've seen a lot of people jump on this. I mean, we're seeing, look at, we have Mars candy bar companies, you know, buying veterinary that is for money, not for love. And that's not who we bring on the show. So I don't want to take up any more of your time because we're coming up on an hour, but I feel like I could talk to you for literally forever. And, and <laughs> it's, you're just such a, you're just such a, like I said, a ray of sunshine to have you in this. And I just want to also say, I'm so sorry that our society puts so much on our veterinarians and, and causes them to want to, I know for me, I just own a little, I call it a little wellness center. We don't have a veterinarian there, but we do um, nutrition and we do a lot of stuff for people. And I've honestly, I hate to say this out publicly, but I've even thought about walking away from it because of the hurt that people can put on you. So I would just kind of like to end this podcast on a note of saying, please be kind to your veterinarians, um, you know, your groomers, your veterinarians, your boarding facilities. There, most people in this love what they do. Don't make them not love what they do, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Don't make them not love. Exactly. I know your animals need more people like Dr. Judy Morgan. So um, is there anything, last things you want to say that, you know, no, I, yeah, I guess what I would say is um, if you are on the fence, should I be making food for my dog? Should I be feeding a raw diet? Should I be moving away from dumping kibble out of a bag into the bowl and walking away and calling it easy? The answer is yes. And <laughs> we, have, we have all the tools to help you feel confident doing that. We even made a home cooking or home prepared food 101 course. So it'll take maybe four hours of your time, but it's to help you feel more confident to know that, because that's one of the biggest things that I hear people say, I'm so afraid I'll screw it up. I'm afraid he won't be getting all the vitamins and minerals that he needs. What if I do it wrong? And then my veterinarian tells me, you know, I was responsible for causing it, which they like to do that if you make your own food. Um, but we, we broke it down and made it simple. That's why we have the cookbooks. That's why we have the course. It's to make it easy enough that anyone could do it. My office man, my old office manager used to store her shoes and purses in her oven. She had never turned it on um, <laughs> and she can cook for her dogs. <laughs> shoes in the oven. Oh, that's, that's funny. That's a good story to, to kind of, I've actually talked to a lot of people who use their oven as a storage space. That's just interesting. <laughs> it's a box not being used. I, would, I don't know that I would have thought about it. I think my husband would kill me if he opened up. I never would have. My husband loves to cook. If he opened up the oven and found my shoes in there, he already teases me that I have too many shoes. Oh, I'm going to do that. I got to do it as a joke. <laughs> I am. I'll let you Tell know how it goes. Storage space. Next time I get, yeah, make sure he doesn't preheat the oven. Without oh, right. Oh, well, I'll just put a pair. I don't, well, I don't want to burn my house down either, but, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, want to put, we'll have to talk about this after, but I want to put a link 
to on my website that will link to how people can make their own foods because I'm a huge supporter of that. And you're right, fear is what is standing in the way. It's fear. And so when you have a veterinarian like Dr. Morgan who's willing to say, look, at, let me take the fear away from you and help you, I want to support that as well. So we'll talk about how I can get some links on on, on there so that people can kind of click on my website and go to your links and stuff because it's Great. super important. Thanks. Um, so I just want to, again, thank you, Dr. Morgan, for just being so lovely and being here and it, it just being willing to teach and come on a podcast for somebody. She didn't even know me. We just sent her an email. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't know who the hell I was. Like, I could have been some whack job, you know, especially since I just told her I was stalking her for two years. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think I told her that when I first called her. So, but um, <laughs> I promise I'm normal. I just want to, I, I have a love for animals that requires me to make sure I'm sending my listeners in the right direction. I have a huge Absolutely. responsibility. I don't just put anybody on the show. I, I talk to them first and I, I kind of learn a little bit about what they're doing. So um, for those of you who want to reach out to me, you know, you can find me in all the show notes and you can get a hold of me. If you're here in Orange County, please stop by and just say hi. I am there six days a week. I'm always there, always, always there. I'm willing to talk to you guys. You can pick up the phone. You can call me. You can find me on my I, there's two Facebook groups that I'm involved in. One is called Millie's House. Um, it's a very small group that we just started. It was something I did so that if people had questions, they could ask me really quick, even though I'm me. I love to bathe dogs, so I'm mostly bathing dogs all day long. It's very therapeutic for me. Um, love to do it. So, but I can't always answer the questions. So you can reach me at Millie's House, or I actually am an admin for a group called Saving Pets One Pet at a Time, and you can always reach me there too. So, all right, everybody, thank you for uh, joining in for this episode, and I will see you soon. Take care, Dr. Morgan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.